United States Africa Command, located in Stuttgart, Germany, is the four-star geographic combatant command headquarters with strategic responsibilities for all U.S. military operations in the Africa area of responsibility. Special Operations Command Africa, also in Stuttgart, Germany, is the two-star theater headquarters responsible for command, control, and operational employment of all U.S. special operations in the Africa area of responsibility. Special Operations Command Forward, North and West Africa, located in Baumholder, Germany, is the Colonel-level group headquarters responsible for command, control, and tactical employment of U.S. special operations in the northern and western areas of Africa, including the Maghreb and Sahel. Special Operations Command and Control Element Lake Chad Basin, located in N'Djamena, Chad, was the Lieutenant Colonel Level Battalion Headquarters, responsible for command and control of two advanced operations bases and tactical synchronization of the U.S. Special Operations in the region. Advanced Operations Base Niger, located in Niamey, is the company headquarters, commanded by a Special Forces Major, which exercises the tactical command and control over multiple Special Forces Operational Detachments Alpha in Niger. At the time of this operation, the acting AOB Niger commander was a Special Forces Captain. The AOB Niger Commander controls multiple U.S. Special Operations Forces teams whose purpose is to train host nation partner forces, enhance host nation security assistance efforts, and conduct counterterrorism operations and surveillance and reconnaissance missions with host nation forces. Southwestern Niger has become a main trafficking route for ISIS Greater Sahara Forces. On October 2, 2017, the U.S. soft team based in Wallam received intelligence that a high-value individual, a sub-commander from the ISIS Greater Sahara Forces, may be moving into their area of operations. The team submitted a mission plan for the vicinity of Tilawa for the next day. The concept of operations that was submitted for approval stated that the purpose of the mission was to conduct a civil and military reconnaissance in the vicinity of Tilawa in order to improve situational awareness of the border region and to improve the effectiveness of military efforts to disrupt ISIS-GS activity in the area. Key to this mission, as drafted, was to coordinate with Zone 1 and Zone 4 leadership for host nation support and permissions, conduct key leader engagements with civil and military leaders in select villages, and assess the population's attitudes towards ISIS-GS. The mission plan did not accurately characterize the intended purpose of the mission. The mission was, in fact, to pinpoint the location of and capture, or if necessary kill, the ISIS-GS subcommander. The inaccurate mission plan was approved by the Acting Advanced Operating Base Commander in Niamey and forwarded to the Special Operations Command Control Element Commander, located in N'Djamena, Chad. The teams manning for this mission consisted of eight U.S. Special Forces soldiers, two U.S. Special Operations Support Soldiers, one Intelligence Contractor, one Nigerian Interpreter, a three-man Nigerian reconnaissance team, and a 31-man Nigerian partner force. The team's U.S. soft personnel traveled in three vehicles, two of which were equipped with mounted M240 machine guns. The 34 Nigerian personnel traveled in five additional vehicles. Once in Tilawa, the team searched for but could not successfully locate the ISIS-GS subcommander. They conducted the rest of their mission and began their return to base. During the team's return to base from Tilawa, they received high-confidence intelligence that placed the ISIS-GS subcommander northwest of Tilawa, near the Mali border. This time-sensitive intelligence gave the Nigerian and U.S. forces a narrow window to capture him while he remained in Niger. The approved concept of operation 
called for another U.S. and Nigerian partnered force to clear the target, with the Wallam based team serving as a quick reaction force. However, due to weather constraints, the other team was forced to return to base. At this time, the target location had been under aerial observation for six continuous hours with no enemy activity. The SOXI commander assessed the mission was low risk and directed the Wallam base team to clear the target location. Through the night of October 3rd, the team made the difficult movement north to the target. On the morning of October 4th, the team reached the objective at sunrise, but the enemy had already departed the area. The team discovered enemy rations, a motorcycle, drying uniforms, and warm fire pits. Partner Nigerians destroyed the enemy material, including the motorcycle. After completing the mission near the Mali border, the team was directed by AOB Niger to return to base. Prior to departing, the team commander directed the overhead ISR asset to maintain coverage on motorcycles heard in the vicinity of the objective in order to gather intelligence on possible enemy routes into Mali. The team departed at approximately 0830 hours and stopped at the village of Tango Tango at 1030 hours so the Nigerian forces could eat breakfast and get water. As the team waited, they conducted an impromptu key leader engagement with the village elder. During the key leader engagement, team members met with leaders and 27 men of the village. The meeting lasted about 30 minutes longer than the team commander expected. At 11.35 hours, the team moved out of the village of Tongo Tongo on their planned route. Approximately 100 meters outside of the village, enemy forces attacked the team with small arms fire directed at the rear of the convoy. Enemy fire was initially light, then intensified as they advanced through the woods on the team's position. At this point, the convoy halted. The team reported enemy contact to the advanced operating base. U.S. Vehicle 1 and U.S. Vehicle 3 immediately began returning fire with their mounted M240 machine guns while team personnel exited vehicles, donned personal protective equipment, and returned small arms fire. The team commander and four Nigerian soldiers maneuvered on foot to the southeast to flank what was estimated to be a small enemy force. At this time, the Nigerian, AOB, and Soxi commanders began sending response elements to the team's location. The team sergeant moved forward with U.S. Vehicle 3 to better control the unit and to coordinate machine gun fire with U.S. Vehicle 1. Staff Sergeant Jeremiah Johnson moved from U.S. Vehicle 3 back to near U.S. Vehicle 2, intending to fire an AT-4 anti-tank rocket at the enemy toward the north. The investigation determined that Niger Vehicle 5 departed the ambush site during this period but did not determine precisely when or by what route. The commander's flanking element continued their movement until a body of water prevented them from advancing further. They identified and engaged enemy fighters across the body of water. The team commander observed a larger-than-expected enemy force moving to his east, which consisted of motorcycles and vehicles with mounted heavy machine guns. The flanking element returned to the halted convoy at 11.57 hours and issued the order to move south to prevent being outflanked by enemy forces. The movement was not immediate as the team commander and team sergeant had to rally and recover Nigerian forces who had taken cover in the woods. Niger vehicles 3 and 4 were immobilized and abandoned. Niger vehicles 1 and 2 were the first to depart. As the rest of the team loaded into their vehicles, they saw Staff Sergeants Brian Black, Jeremiah Johnson, and Dustin Wright in the vicinity of U.S. Vehicle 2. The team commander signaled to begin movement, and Staff Sergeant Jeremiah Johnson acknowledged the order with a thumbs up. A team member threw a smoke grenade to conceal the team's movement. 
Staff Sergeant Dustin Wright entered U.S. Vehicle 2 and began driving it slowly forward, while Staff Sergeants Brian Black and Jeremiah Johnson walked along the protected side of the vehicle. Staff Sergeant Brian Black moved slightly ahead of U.S. Vehicle 2 and was killed by enemy small arms fire. Staff Sergeant Dustin Wright stopped and exited the vehicle. Staff Sergeants Jeremiah Johnson and Dustin Wright remained with Staff Sergeant Brian Black until overwhelming enemy fire forced them to withdraw. 85 meters southwest of U.S. Vehicle 2, Staff Sergeant Jeremiah Johnson was shot and rendered immobile. Staff Sergeant Dustin Wright stopped, returned to near his teammate's position, and continued to engage the enemy until both were fatally wounded. U.S. Vehicles 1 and 3 and 2 Nigerian vehicles drove approximately 700 meters south of the ambush site to form a defensive position referred to as Position 2. The team realized that not all of their personnel and vehicles were present at the defensive position. After repeated attempts to radio the team members last seen in the vicinity of U.S. Vehicle 2, two U.S. soft members from U.S. Vehicle 3 volunteered to return on foot to the ambush site to attempt to locate them. Sergeant LaDavid Johnson, a special operations mechanic and the driver for U.S. Vehicle 3, moved to the rear of the vehicle to engage the enemy with the vehicle-mounted M240 machine gun. When that weapon ran out of ammunition, he switched to the M2010 sniper rifle. Approximately 10 minutes later, Two additional U.S. team members moved to join the pair that was maneuvering back to the ambush site. The first pair moved to where they thought U.S. Vehicle 2 would be, encountering and killing several enemy combatants before needing to withdraw under fire. As they were withdrawing to the southwest, they linked up with their follow-on teammates and began planning another route to U.S. Vehicle 2. Back at position 2, the team commander and his element continued to battle the enemy attacking from the east. At approximately 12.25 hours, enemy gun trucks and dismounted forces opened fire on position 2 from the southeast. The overwhelming fire forced the team commander to order a withdrawal. Two Nigerian vehicles departed the area moving to the southwest. U.S. Vehicle 1 circled the perimeter under intense fire gathering American and Nigerian personnel. Simultaneously, Sergeant LaDavid Johnson and Nigerian personnel attempted to board U.S. Vehicle 3. Special Operations members last saw Sergeant LaDavid Johnson moving around to the driver's position of U.S. Vehicle 3 between 1225 and 1230 hours. U.S. Vehicles 1 and 3 came under overwhelming enemy machine gun fire preventing Sergeant LaDavid Johnson from entering his vehicle. Believing Sergeant Johnson was in control of his vehicle, the driver of U.S. Vehicle 1 accelerated hard to the northwest. Unable to enter U.S. Vehicle 3, Sergeant Johnson and two partner Nigerians became separated from U.S. Vehicle 1. They escaped on foot, eventually running to the southwest with the enemy in pursuit. The Nigerian soldiers were killed with small arms fire roughly 400 meters from position 2. Sergeant Johnson evaded for an additional 450 meters and reached the only concealment in the vicinity, a single thorny tree. At this position, he continued to fight. An enemy vehicle armed with a mounted heavy machine gun, stopped within 100 meters of Sergeant Johnson's location, firing on his position and cutting off further escape while enemy forces closed in.
Leaving position two, U.S. Vehicle 1 moved northwest, pursued by enemy vehicles and under intense enemy fire. Team members did not realize U.S. Vehicle 3 did not follow. During this movement, five of the seven passengers in the vehicle sustained gunshot wounds, with one Nigerian fatally wounded. The driver was shot through the elbow, but continued to drive. The team commander, riding in the bed of U.S. Vehicle 1, was shot and thrown off the vehicle. The driver performed another circular maneuver under heavy fire to recover the commander and resumed movement towards the northwest with the enemy in pursuit. Once inside the tree line, U.S. Vehicle 1 became stuck in mud. The four Special Forces soldiers who previously went to the ambush site saw U.S. Vehicle 1 and moved to rejoin those team members. At 12.33 hours, the team radioed that they were being overrun. This was the team's first report for assistance. Expecting their radios would be recovered by the enemy, the team disabled them, ending the ability to communicate using these devices. Seven American and four Nigerian personnel fled U.S. Vehicle 1, evading under concentrated small arms and mortar fire. They moved through the swamp, broke contact with the enemy, and stopped at the clearing on the northwest side of the wooded area. The team established a hasty defense at this location at approximately 12.50 hours. They wrote short messages to loved ones on personal devices, believing they would soon be overrun. By 13.11 hours, two U.S. unarmed, Unmanned aerial vehicles arrived on station, establishing communications with both the team and inbound French aircraft. Two French Mirage aircraft arrived at 13.18 hours, but were unable to determine friend from foe. The French performed two shows of force at 13.20 and 13.25 hours. At this time, the enemy ceased pursuing the team but remained in the area. At 13.30 hours, the team relayed their location, the status of casualties, and requested a medical evacuation for the wounded. Beginning at 14.58 hours, the Mirages executed two more shows of force at treetop level. This caused the enemy elements to rapidly depart the area. French helicopters arrived in the vicinity at 1600 hours and searched for the team for 40 minutes. A team member moved into a clearing, waving an American flag to the helicopters to establish their identity as friendly forces. At 1641 hours, the Special Operations Command Africa Commander in Stuttgart, Germany, recommended to the U.S. Africa Command Commander that they declare a personnel recovery event. This notified units throughout the Department of Defense that service members were missing and activated contingency planning efforts. Concurrently, a Nigerian response force arrived by vehicle at the team's location and mistook the team for enemy forces, firing on them for 48 seconds with automatic weapons until they were positively identified. Fortunately, no one was injured further. French commandos and Nigerian forces secured the landing zone, enabling the French helicopters to land at 1655 hours and evacuate the team 31 minutes later. At approximately 1825 hours, Nigerian quick reaction forces discovered the remains of Staff Sergeant Brian Black Staff Sergeant Jeremiah Johnson, and Staff Sergeant Dustin Wright at the ambush site. At this time, Sergeant LaDavid Johnson's status and whereabouts were still unknown. Throughout the remainder of the evening of October 4th, and over the next 36 hours, three ISR assets searched for friendly signals and signs of life. Additional U.S. soft teams, French commandos, and Nigerian forces, swept the ambush site and surrounding area in an effort to recover the dead or wounded. 
the search teams and ISR assets did not locate Sergeant LaDavid Johnson due to the distance from his last known location and the density of the tree under which he had concealed himself. At 0625 hours on October 6th, as nationally controlled personnel recovery elements staged for the search and recovery of Sergeant LaDavid Johnson, Tongo Tongo locals notified Nigerian military that they had found the remains of a soldier. At 1200 hours, the Nigerian military arrived at the location of Sergeant LaDavid Johnson. When Sergeant Johnson was found by Nigerian forces, he was beneath the dense canopy of a thorny tree. Sergeant Johnson was found lying on his back with his arms to his sides. His hands were not bound. Sergeant Johnson was clothed, though his boots and serviceable equipment had been removed by the enemy. The investigation determined Sergeant Johnson was not captured alive. His remains were transferred to U.S. custody at 1522 hours.